Oh, I think it's okay. Okay, and can you see my topic here in the yeah. group? Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, nice girl. My time's running out. During my lifetime, my mom urged me again and again that I should be a nice girl. I should never talk aloud in the public. When others are talking something bad about me, I should give them a smile, tolerate them to show my generous instead of fighting them back. Following with their advice, indeed, I am a nice girl. But as a nice girl, I didn't receive nice things. When some naughty boys laughing at me, I took a deep breath, told myself that I should follow what my mom had told me. So eventually, I said nothing. As a result, more and more classmates are getting unscrupulous to laughing at me. They made me nickname, always asking me, why are you so fat? These bad words, or even insulting words, had hurt me deeply. As I grew up, I started taking exercise and gradually fell in love with boxing. Before, the only reason that I took boxing lesson was just I thought boxing was really cool. As time goes by, I gradually enjoy the feeling that every time I try my best to reach the target practice. I gradually enjoy the feeling that every time I exhaust myself after every boxing lesson. But this time, my mom told me again. She said, never tell others that you are taking the boxing lesson. Remember, it's not for girls. If others know that you are taking the boxing lesson, they will consider you as a top girl and become afraid of you. Hearing this, it really makes me ponder that. Why are boxing girls are considered as rude? Why a nice girl should tolerate? Why we girls cannot just fight back? Considering this question, or we can discuss it in another words, the feminism. Before, many people may only know that the feminism is a term, and the supporters of it are always a crowd of passionate women. When they are giving their speech or establishing their opinion, the most things they do is to complain about the unfair in their society. But without telling people what is the feminism? At the core of the feminism, actually, there are more things we can learn. Many people may think that the feminism is to ask the men to protect women. Some girls even think that feminism means girls deserve all. Just give an example. They may think, because they are girls, they are in the weak position in many ways, like stamina or walking ability. So they should be treated nicer, and boys ought to do anything for them. While the true feminism was supposed that girls are never weaker than boys, they can also do the things that boys can do. So they should be treated um, equals, and their statement and treatment should be equal to the men. I still remember when I first knew the feminism, it was from Emma Watson's speech. It was she gave me the first impression of the feminism. It was she let me know that women are never weaker than men in the ability aspect. There was a comment under her social platform, which I still remember clearly until now. It was a girl who wanted to be an engineer, but was strongly rejected by her father only because of the stereotypes of girls. So she wanted to ask Emma for help. And then she received a reply and it says, be an engineer, prove to them. Yes, why can't we just be an engineer? Taylor Swift had also said in her documentary, Miss America, I want to love glitter and also stand up for the double standards that exist in our society. I want to wear pink and tell you how I feel about the politics at the same time. And I don't think that those things will cancel each other out. 
as a girl, I have seen so much things like this before. Some parents treat their son with a favor, but always ignore their daughters. In some poor family, some girls even cannot go to school just in order to save money for her family while her brothers can. But what is the consequence? The consequence is that the boys always get spoiled and his sister have to clean up the messy situation for him every time, even when he grows up. I don't want this to happen anymore. I hope girls can learn science, can be a boxer, can fight them back if they are treated unnicely. They can be a sweet girl. They can also be a tough girl who stands strong to help protect the women's rights. We can do what we want to do. We can be what we want to be. Who say that girls are weaker than boys? Who say that girls can never do some jobs? Nowadays, the feminism is having a greater influence on many people's mind. Many people are paying greater attention on it. And I know that more and more women are becoming aware that they also have the equal's right. However, conservative thinking, feudal opinion are still occupying most people's mind in this world. Some countries still looking up to men and down to women. So, once I support the feminism, it is no doubt that I'm fighting against with the most people thinking in our society. I am afraid that my family, my friends, the people around me will also get stubborn and refuse my idea. But even if I'm refused, I won't give up because this is a new era and this is the time that belongs to us, the young. We have a whole lifetime to change people's mind. We have a whole lifetime to show them, to convince them what is the feminism and what is the girl's power. That's all. Thank you. Do I, do I start now? Sure. Okay. Um, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Mm, right. <laughs> My time starts now. In a recent world tour concert that took place in Miami, where thousands of people gathered together to hear the music by a popular singer on the big screen, played a short video of the star stripping herself down slowly and being honest with her body. That was the famous talented pop star, Billie Eilish. She's an 18 year old celebrity, which makes me wonder what I'm doing with my life. Yet, instead of wearing evening gowns, tights, or any outfit that shows any skin, she wears oversized clothes all the time. The reason she's doing all these is that she takes this as a protest, a refusal towards societal judgments on body size. A concern I would like to address today, body shaming. This is nothing new. Bias regarding the understanding of beauty was so deeply ingrained in the world, in human society and culture. And it's closer than you think. I could never forget what happened in junior high. I was the most heavily weight girl in my class. And when the boys wanted to insult each other, they accused each other of being attracted to me. Like that's something humiliating, to be attracted to a fat girl 
who hasn't done anything wrong, passes all her tests, and has her own passion for public speaking. Now, I was shocked on hearing it, and then angry, and finally dejected, for there's nothing I could immediately do to change the conversation. Of course, I couldn't stop them from talking or lose weight overnight. I felt powerless. I was smart. I have a good grade. I can solve lots of problems, but I can't solve this one. It certainly took a long time before I could manage the doubt and fear I have in myself and stand confidently in front of people again. The most direct and immediate impact is the consequences of body shaming on mental health. Our acknowledgement of our bodies links directly to our confidence and self-approval. The popular rapper Lizzo recently said in her tweet that loving yourself don't happen overnight, while self-hate is years of internalized programming resulting from external influences. Indeed, it's the systemic concept of beauty from the surroundings that has been shaping the way we view ourselves and others as well. Now, I don't have the perfect body. There, I, I admit it. However, I don't have eating disorders. I live a normal life. I work hard, just like everyone else, hoping to have a better future for myself. Now, I'm a teenage girl. I have, I have problems with my mom. <laughs> but here's what got me thinking. One evening, my mom walked in, and she saw me sitting there in front of my desk, and all of a sudden it turned into a fight. She wasn't satisfied with my body. And she's worried, she's concerned, she's afraid that I might not get a good job or might not find a good husband. It seemed that all the work I've been doing for the past 16 years could be on the same scale with having an attractive body. That's why she thinks it's so urgent for me to be reshaped, to intentionally deform my body from the way it was. Now, I'm not going to lie here, I was mad. Hearing that all my effort on my studies would be useless and inefficient for my future without having a diet. I was angry because what she said subverted my plans and my dreams. But I love my mother and I know she loves me. Her words were said with such sincerity, without any intention to hurt me, and yet injected with bias coming from the person closest to me on earth. What made me feel sad and diminished was not what she said or that she's the person telling me this, but the fact that what she said might be true, that appearance and the figure of your body are such conclusive factors that when it comes to employment and interviews and the start of romantic relationships, your shape somehow decides the future for you. Can you imagine? It's a true principle the world operates under. Now, I wear dental braces for a better look for future. The phrase ambiguous yet intimidating that parents used to get the kids to the dentists. I am still wearing them. <laughs> this lovely treatment for my healthy teeth was in no way cheap in cost. And it's not just the money. To make space, the dentist had to took out one of my front teeth. I went off to school receiving however friendly jokes. The tooth left alone in my mouth cuts my tongue, my facial muscle feels sore, and I'm going through the pain most teenagers did as my teeth were pulled slowly to the right place. The process was never easy for anyone. But then I asked myself, what am I doing? And who am I doing this for? It seemed to be a widely accepted fact that people who are born without the perfect teeth are expected to correct themselves into a way that looks better. Who is looking? It's us. We created an oppressive judgmental system without even knowing its existence or its harm. I've seen girls struggling with the same problems like I am. My friends ask me constantly if they got fat or if they have the perfect look as if I'm going to offer any critical advice to them. The truth is, 
I love my friends for their personalities and insights. Yet how they look on the outside mattered more to themselves rather than me, the actual viewer. The recognition of beauty has become so rigid, unjustifiable, and yet so latent and subtle that we suffer from it without ourselves noticing. In the 1960s, the American poet Sheila Black wrote in her piece, What You Mourn. The body they tried so hard to fix, straighten, was simply mine. And I loved it, as you love your own country. But now we don't get to control our body figures anymore for their opinions that our bodies seem to be obligated to bear. My mother tried to fix my body out of her love. My friends wanted me to comment on their bodies out of their trust. People seem to forget what makes a relationship matter. We forget about what's truly valuable in our daily conversations. Now, what is valuable anyway? I believe, and I hope you agree with me, that it's the thoughts we exchange, it's the love and support we share, and the creativities beyond the physical world and so much more are what's really everlasting and valuable. We're living in the 21st century, a time when human beings are searching for new pathways and breakthroughs as we always have been. Founder of the COVA project, G.D. Anderson once said, it isn't about making women stronger. Women are already strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives that strength. And if we could try to abandon the prejudice that's eroding our judgment and focus more on the, on the amazing thoughts, innovations, and talent human minds could contain. There will be so much more changes and love beyond our imagination. Mm. The philosopher Descartes once included that I think, therefore I am. After all, it's what we think that defines who we are and not our bodies or appearances. The love and respect we have for our bodies and our mind and each other is the love we have for the world and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you see me as a help me? Yeah. And Time start now. Hi everyone, my name is Ye Rui. I am from Jiangsu Tianyi High School. Today, I want to talk about team conformity. We all hear about these words, Air Jordan, Nike, and Yes. My friends constantly talk about these shoe brands during the lunchtime or after class. They often discuss when new shoes are launching and where they are going to grab them. There is a joke. Shoes are life. Many students say that they can't live without shoes. I even saw a picture of shoes being put into a shape of heart into my WeChat moments. This phenomenon is going viral. Many people wait in line for hours, even overnight, outside the Air Jordan shoe shop for new shoes release. It is too crazy just for shoes, doesn't it? But have we ever thought about the cause of this phenomenon? I asked several people the reason of the sneaker hole. Two words appear with high frequency. My friends, a lot of the so-called sneaker hands are influenced largely by their friends. Thus, I was wondering if conformity behavior is behind this phenomenon. Conformity is the act of matching attitudes, beliefs, and behavior to group norms or being like-minded. Norms are implicit, 
specific roles shared by a group of individuals that guide their interactions with others. I used a phrase to generalize this definition. Go with the stream. Some teenagers feel that they might be isolated if they don't talk about sneakers, so they match their hobby with a group to be an insider. What is the cause of conformity behavior? That is a problem. We need to think about it. Currently, teenagers conform to anything and everything to avoid standing out in the fear of being judged or exiled by their peers. Even if they don't agree to the beliefs of the clique they have chosen to fit into. Teens tend to change their personality when they come into contact with new people. Shifting from being shallow and petty to carrying in a matter of minutes. This stress of always needing to fit in causes teens to be afraid of the possibility of not being able to. Secondly, teenagers try to go well with others and build relatively good relationship with others. So, they have to share a common identity to know about them better. They will try their best to greet others' taste. For instance, when I enter the high school and need to adapt the new environment and make new friends, I have to find the same hobbies with my friends. Third, people tend to be afraid of failure. In some cases, looking to the rest of the group for clues for how we should behave can actually be helpful. Other people might have greater knowledge or experience than we do. So, following their lead can actually be instructive. In the famous age experiment, parts of a study done on conformity and human behavior. A team sat with many actors and was given a set of lies. He was asked to determine which of the two lies were equally sized. Every time he would give the correct answer, the actors would give the wrong answer. After only two or three times, the team started having doubts about himself and giving the same incorrect answer as the rest of the actors. Not even confident enough to trust what he saw with his own eyes over others. Of course, there is healthy conformity. Listening, when your mother tells you to wash the dishes is considerable, healthy and normal. However, the unhealthy kind in which teens blindly follow the ideas and actions of a group of people without realizing what kind of negative effects it has on them and society today is growing to be increasing common. But when we follow others, we should also think independently and critically instead of follow blindly. In the sneaker case, before we buy shoes, I think we should think about whether I really need these shoes or just want to please others and fit in. We need to think twice and don't be impulsive. We should choose the most suitable shoes instead of the most expensive and the most fashionable ones. Everyone has their own style. What is good for others might not be suitable for you. Of course, there is no need to do something you don't like to match others' taste. We should be the true self. We should choose the things we like to do and have our own ideas. In conclusion, team conformity is very common. 
Most of the time, it will bring us the right information, provide a convenience, and help us deal with interpersonal relationships better. But that is also a negative side. It will make us lose our value judgment or let us choose a path that is not suitable for us. Anyway, we should analyze carefully and rationally before doing things. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me and see me clearly? Yeah. Okay, so. My time starts now. When I say history, what is the first word that comes into your minds? Boring? Uninteresting? Unnecessary? Wow, expect it. True, we have all hated to sit through boring history lectures and to recite historic events for exams and potentially credits. But it is fascinating that so many students dislike history while our educators are putting more and more emphasis on this subject. For example, Princeton University requires high school students to take at least one year of history related courses in order to apply or else even STEM kids can't apply to Princeton. Why is history so important for educators, yet such a pain for students? What is going on and how can we solve this problem? Since my dream is to become a history teacher in the future, I ponder these questions a lot, and I finally found an answer. I am honored to share my findings on history education here with all of you, though pitiful because this is my final time. In modern society, many people question the existence of historical studies. As a famous Chinese writer and sociologist Fei Xiaotong wrote in Rural China, in societies in which progress is stagnant, history has vital importance because the experience of predecessors can be used by future generations in order to avoid the same mistakes again. However, in a society that is progressing at rapid speed, much like the information era of today, History may lose its importance. Under constant change, previous knowledge may lose its function in the present era. So history wanes compared to practice. However, I believe that in societies that are progressing at rapid speed, the importance of history does not wane. The medians may change, but the concept does not. Take the recent coronavirus outbreak for an example. A similar epidemic happened in the 14th century, the famous Black Death which killed two thirds of the burgeoning population. In 2020 China, the death tolls of the coronavirus is less than 100,000 in a country that has a population of 1.4 billion people, which is well below the death rate of two thirds in Europe in the Middle Ages. True, major changes took place since the 14th century. Our social structures are different and technologies advanced, which is probably the major reason why our death tolls decreased. But unless we see the importance of these epidemics from historical events, all the technology of modern times cannot be effectively applied. In 2020, we deeply acknowledged the catastrophic effect of an epidemic such as the Black Death. So we took the coronavirus epidemic extremely seriously. The Chinese government made the decision to lock down Wuhan city as early as January the 23rd. And companies such as Alipay are using big data to track potential cases and alert people via the internet. The government funded research on vaccines for coronavirus and also supported hospitals with medical equipment such as respirators. Without the attention of this epidemic from every member in society, we could not have put these advanced technologies into use and we could not have succeeded in this catastrophe. Even though the means changed, such as technologies, the contents does not change. History offers us lessons that are similar to initiatives, which does not change whether society progresses or not. After we acknowledge why our educators emphasize the importance of history, 
we can start analyzing what is going on with our historical education. In my eyes, one major misconception of history is that we should study it from afar. This idea was addressed by an African-American writer in the mid to late 1900s, Alice Walker, in her famous short story, Everyday Use. The three characters are a family of African-Americans, and they own many quilts that are handmade by their grandmothers and even great-grandmothers. The elder daughter attempted to take these quilts away and give them to a museum in order to preserve African-American culture. But the younger daughter simply refused to let her sister take away her memory of her grandmother, which was already entwined in the handmade quilts. In the end, Mama gave the quilts to the younger daughter. This story was written during an era when African Americans were searching for their collective identity. Intellectuals such as Alice Walker punished the best ways to preserve African American culture. If we hang the quilts up in a museum, people could marvel at the artistry of this piece of art from the past. Maybe more people could see this piece of art that way, but seldom do visitors of a museum feel psychologically connected to what is on display. Then, without this connection, the quilts became merely commodities and they became empty art. But for an individual such as the younger daughter to use the quilts, maybe not many people would see this piece of art, but it functions as a bridge, connecting the psyche of the user in the present with that of the maker in the past. And this connection is what art is trying to search. In order for a piece of art to be meaningful, it has to make a connection with the audience, making the audience feel touched instead of saying, oh, wow, it's pretty. Yeah, right. Okay. So what I believe is history is in the quilts. Normally, we see history from afar, in a museum, from textbooks, from a lecture, etc but we don't often attach ourselves to history to try to make the connection. Only looking at history from afar makes history a piece of empty art. Only by experiencing can we extract the essence, the beauty, and the meaning of history. So instead of reading how George Washington crossed the Delaware from a book and reciting this fact, imagine that you're George Washington himself, about to make an arduous journey and facing decisions that could shape or reshape human history forever then maybe you would understand why he is considered one of the greatest figures in human history. Another example, imagine you were a resident of Palestine under Roman rule. How would you spare the sorrows of being ruled by a tyrant? By creating a religion, perhaps? So what I'm trying to say is, instead of reading about these people, actually try to emphasize by walking into their lives. We humans are curious and active in nature, claimed Aristotle, so experience brings us joy. Use your imagination to soar through history, taking the identity of different people of different times and trying to understand their actions, their ideas, and eventually their society and what they left behind for us. So, how exactly should educators teach students to experience history? This is where modern technology comes into play. A video clip about the Great Wall would be better than a teacher reading facts from the textbook. A project about Renaissance artists will be better than a teacher writing names on the whiteboard. A virtual tour of the Versailles would be better than a teacher explaining Rococo art on a pedestal. Our educators should not be the ones stuffing information into the students' chests. They should be guides in the world of history. They hold only the key to the door of historical education and they do not own the world behind that door. Give the keys to the students, extract the eye from historical education, and allow our students to explore the world of history by themselves. Some might say that we don't have enough time for exploration. Exam days are closing in, and they need to pass this class. True, three years of high school and maybe four years of college is not nearly enough for a student to grasp the concept of history. But what about a lifetime? If we allow our students to explore history, maybe they would not progress as fast as we hoped they would, but slowing of pace allows them to discover their interest in history. And this interest is what pushes them to study this subject throughout their lifetimes. Which is more important, short-term grades without understanding or long-term progress with interest and passion? Our goal should not only be good grades, understanding the textbook, reciting, copying, anything else on the surface. 
we should teach our students about perpetual learning, about self-fulfillment, and about life in general. Dear educators of modern times, we know the importance of history, yet we're teaching the subject in the wrong way, ruining the impression of history in the minds of our students, who would become the future of our society, our country, and our world. We cannot let the importance of history wane in the future. Thus, our education needs serious reconsiderations. We need to teach our students that history is more than merely copying and reciting. If one learns to experience history, one would acquire greater ability to emphasize, achieve emotional resurrection, and attain a higher level of pleasure. If our society learns to experience history, the importance of history will no longer wane, and our society will be guided by the perpetual existence of historical lessons and initiatives. How do we make the future of history better? By renewed education methods of experiencing history. Thank you. Five. Yeah. Can I start now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. My time starts now. Have you heard or experienced the unfairness in the society? when your boss treats people unequally, when prisoners with some accusations spend a different amount of jail time. Have you think about the root source behind the causes of such phenomenon and how to deal or even change this phenomenon? Obviously, our society has lost its fairness since the first time the regulation is built. So before I talk about my own life experience, I'd like to ask you if you are familiar or not about this term. Capitalism. Indeed, this is a universally known economic concept that the majority of resources are belong to and allocated by individual. But the way I use it in my whole speech is that people who are successful in different industries abuse their power to take away others' chance of success. On the positive side, capitalism could boost an economy, but the overuse of capitalism will lead to big problems. In the past 16 years, I seldom care about my academic achievements. Instead, I spend hours and hours playing with my phone, go after pop stars, and social with someone that I have never met before. Although my parents worry about my situation, and I know how bad I was, I still cannot find a reason for me to change my attitude. However, a turning point appeared in May last year when I received the, the rejection letter from a dream high school. When I know that my classmate has been enrolled by this school because the parents are sent to provide financial support and argue for their child because of the social status they have. Well, I was not upset, but mad. I'm mad at myself. If I could spend more time and put more effort on studying, there is still a chance for me to fight against those capitalism. Then I deleted those apps that may distract me, as well as many inconsequential netizens. I never realized that a person could be so indomitable, and my parents were scared about my sudden change. Luckily, the effort I have put finally embodied into my academic scores. I naively thought that as long as I have good grades, 
as long as I show my responsibilities when I conduct school events, I could be at least acknowledged by my school advisor. However, all my effort has been denied in front of capitalism. I applied for setting up a club last semester. Only two students did the same in my high school. The shareholder's child and I. Guess what? Both she and my school advisor refused to provide the profile template that should be shared as a public source. I believe this kind of unfairness doesn't just happen to me, but happen to everyone sitting here. Unless you are the most powerful people in your working area, or you have the most influential family in the society. Let's take a glance on how capitalism has set up our life as well as our predecessors. I don't know if you guys are interested in Japanese animation. Detective Conan. The movie edition released in 2002. The Phantom of Baker Street. An over-advanced AI betray human being and they try to kill all the children who have eminent family background. This evil AI says an unforgettable sentence that Japan will not have any development in the long run because the highest social class is fixed among a group of people. Plutocrats' children will step in their parents' shoes. Doctors' children will become a doctor. And children who came from, who came from a family that is dedicated in law will monopolize the court. Murder is definitely unacceptable. But let's think about the essence behind this sentence. Although a specialized family in certain industry could provide more professional knowledge for their destined, once these families are corrupted and they bond each other, then, I mean, the whole society is going to be controlled by them. Let's take South Korea as an example. Due to research conducted by Korean economists, the top 10 powerful companies in South Korea contribute 85% of total GDP in that country. Probably you cannot imagine how big it is. In China, the top 100 companies only make 37% of total GDP. The consequence of this phenomenon in South Korea is that those plutocrats could even decide who will be the next president. So to speak, there is definitely no fairness in South Korea because it is impossible for people like me that don't have any family background to confront with those capitalists. Probably you argue that this phenomenon is only happening to South Korea and maybe to some specific countries. Then I will tell you that this phenomenon happens in every diminutive corner in our life. Do you have group chat? You definitely have. In those group chats, you can be easily kicked out by the group owner if you say some words that is not respectful enough to them. I experienced these kind of issues many times several years ago when I was a rebellious child. You must be very angry and lousy, just like what I feel. But what can we do about it? This is how domineering the capitalism is. I'm sorry to tell you that it is impossible to eliminate capitalism because people who are rich need this capitalism to further amplify their power. And other people normally cannot deal with the hardship of defying their superiors. But our performance and attitude could be changed. We have Zhu Yuanzhang, who is almost starved to death in a temple and finally became the founder of the Ming Dynasty. We have Li Kashin, who was forced to move to Hong Kong and started his first job as a salesman. Now he's at the Chinese place on the Forbes list. We have Napoleon, who was an ordinary child born in France and finally established the French Empire. Even people like me could successfully set up that club without any reference. Capitalism has led hundreds and hundreds of young people losing their deserved opportunity. But I can give you thousands and thousands of examples that people who don't have any family background and stand on the antithesis of those capitalism are still working hard for their life. Those people who are using their power to fight against those capitalism is called a hero. I am very thankful to those heroes. Because of them, 
we know that ordinary people have the potential to confront with capitalists. And we know that ordinary people could be successful. Our society has been dominated by capitalism all the way since the establishment of modern society. And now it's our responsibility to change this situation. And we must do. Thank you. Hi, judges. Um, are you guys ready? Yes. Okay. Well, I will start my last speech of today. My time starts now. Imagine this. One day, you eagerly go to your parents to seek advice on an essay you're writing, hoping to get some enriching feedback. But soon, you realize that your parents have never seen you as a matured young adult. The feedback sounding more like commands from your boss than advice from a mentor. This happened to me last Tuesday night. When I consulted my dad for ideas on how to write this very speech, it ended with me in tears. Now you may ask, how come? Do I have a horrible relationship with my dad? Not at all. I can share with my parents almost all of my thoughts, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. What happened instead exemplifies the very topic of today's speech, the generation gap. The generation gap refers to differences in beliefs, interests, cultures, and ideologies that exist between different generations. Differences that result in our intense quarrels with our parents. This issue is increasingly relevant because today students like me, like us, with international education are sprouting with unprecedented momentum. Our idealism, youthfulness, and liberal ways of thinking increasingly clash with our parents' pragmatism, assertiveness, and a deeply Confucianist way of thinking. And this is problematic. Having poor parent-child relationship means doing worse in education outcomes, substance abuse, and in mental health. One could even resort to crime. A UC Berkeley study found that children of criminal parents are twice as likely to become criminals themselves. Whereas the William and Mary study found that having a poor parent-child relationship has an even greater impact on crime rates than having, uh, than having criminal parents. And so today, I want to share from my personal experiences the causes of the generation gap and how it can be reconciled. After all, our parents are the ones who gave life to us. With a foundation of care and affection, we can overcome this. Ever since first grade, I was tasked with doing the dishes, and it all started out new and exciting. I would make detergent bubbles go everywhere. But fast forward to fifth grade. One day, exhausted from a long day of school, I didn't feel like doing the dishes. Now I knew my dad wants me to help out with chores to let me know that as a member of the family, it's also my job to keep the house clean. But I know I learned the lesson after having broken several plates and bowls and spoons and cups, I know I have mastered the art of dishwashing. Not doing it once doesn't mean I'm a spoiled brat, but it wasn't enough to my dad. Why, I asked, I needed to have a convincing purpose because I say so. Because I say so. The top culprit of the generation gap. This phrase implies the absolute authority of our parents 
no room for discussion, nothing. And I, being taught at school to challenge the things I'm told, refuse to cower. I rebutted by sliding the Declaration of Independence I learned in history class. All men are created equal. And you can probably predict. Our conversation ended with my dad outraged and me crying while doing the dishes. To think back now, I seem pretty childish. Spending five minutes to do the dishes is nothing. Yes, I had a long day at school, but my parents probably had an even longer day at work, earning the money that is used to send me to amazing schools. But a few years later, a not so childish conflict unfolded. My parents are both from Southeast Asia, raised in rather traditional families. And under the influence of Confucianism and Taoism preserved by my ancestors from China, they deeply value a sense of respect for the elders. But in middle school, under the encouragement of my few Christian friends and out of my own interest, I began attending weekly Bible studies. This became problematic when I revisited my hometown and had to kneel before my grandmother's shrine to burn incense, which I learned was an act a Christian is forbid from doing. Now, religion is a rather sensitive topic. I can't say I'm fully religious now or then, but I was in the process of discovering myself. Faced with this dilemma, I was unwilling to kneel. My dad was outraged. He yelled, if going to Bible studies is teaching you to not pay respect to your grandmother, you better stop going. A few years later, when I revisited this quarrel for one of my essays on multiculturalism, I sent my dad a draft to let him help me review. <laughs> yeah, not a wise choice. I had undermined the seriousness of our generation gap. <laughs> my dad immediately called me and asked if I meant what I wrote or was simply exaggerating for the sake of the assignment. I am speaking from my genuine emotions, I said. He later texted me. If I am dead, will you not burn incense for me too? I was shocked, lost for words to say. How can my dad think that burning incense is the only way to honor the deceased? And why is he so disappointed in me when I'm simply disagreeing with a cultural tradition, a culture I was barely even part of? I still haven't found a way to explain to him that even if, even if I adopt another religion, it does not mean I will love or respect the family any less. By this time, you may have already pictured my dad in your head, this middle-aged man who always makes his daughter cry. But the truth is, despite our conflicts, my parents and I have an enviable relationship. They will call me every day, Monday to Friday, when I stay in the school dorms, and they're always the first to come to my mind when I have something to share. Despite our generational, cultural, ideological, or whatever gaps one can think of, I am still my parents' daughter, and they're still the ones who raised me up so that I can stand on mountains. The good news is, there are ways to overcome the generation gap through effective ways of communication from both parties, the situation can be saved. To teenagers like me, first, ask yourself, when is the best time to explain your thoughts and motivations? When your parents just ask you to do something or when they're casually enjoying their morning coffee some other day? The answer is obvious. Effective communication is about timing, and the simple rule is, Agree first, explain later. Second, try to see the bigger picture. When your parents demanded you to do something, focus instead on your gratitude and respect towards your parents instead of the way they exercise authority. You'll be surprised at how much easier the task becomes and how much more mature you are in your parents' eyes. And to parents, first, Try to reflect upon your own childhood. When you were our age, you know you weren't just some rebellious teenager. Your acts had well found a reason, and so did your child. Effective communication is also about approach. 
And when you switch on your empathy button, realizing that no authority is sacrificed by listening, you'll instead gain valuable insights into your child's colorful world. And second, acknowledge the change. Your child is raised in a completely different era. The education system, technological usage, and even cultural context are drastically different from before. With this in mind, you'll begin to see where your child's supposed rebelliousness is coming from and whether if it can really be labeled as teenage rebellion. On Tuesday, when my talk with my dad did not go well, I chose to go to sleep early instead. Well, if you can call 12.30 a.m. early. The next morning, we got him on as if nothing happened. And maybe, maybe after he hears the speech, when his empathy button is turned on, I will then explain to him why I was upset. Timing and approach. Bridging the generation gap is not as difficult as you think. And lastly, Remember that it's not too late to improve on your relationships. Better late than never. And even if, even if you and your parents have gotten into the habit of keeping things to yourself, even if their parenting methods seem intolerable, I sincerely hope that with this knowledge, we'll all grow up to become better parents to our future children. Thank you. And if there is no questions, the contestant and the audiences can leave the room. <laughs>